Hello again, Netrunner fans. Willing Dunn here, and I'm bringing you the second part of my first contact review. This is the runner cards in the pack. Even though we had a lot of exciting stuff in the court portion of the pack, I think we're going to see that the runner portion is at least as exciting. And the first card in the pack is the long-awaited new Anarch ID. It is Quetzal, Free Spirit, a Gmod ID, 4515, like normal, no link, and once per turn, break one barrier subroutine. I sort of feel like this is the good kit. One of the big problems I've always had with kit is that rather than making your icebreaker package smaller, which is what you might anticipate her ability from the ID doing, it keeps it the same, comparable to a different ID, or sometimes it's even more cards. Basically, you have to play enough Codegate Breakers in your setup with Kit to be able to reliably, in the early game, use her power. Otherwise, I feel like it's just kind of a waste to lose all that influence. If we contrast that with Quetzal... The, Ken the Quetzal deck, I think, will have a smaller Icebreaker package than your standard Anarch, and also has a wider range of Icebreakers you can choose from versus, say, Kit. I am really excited to see what people come up with with Quetzal. Right now, I'm on board with most of the online discussion that the way to do it is going to be E3 feedback implants with some sort of AI breaker, probably... Overmind could be Darwin, uh, Crypsis. So we have a variety of options with these AI breakers. We're not going to be spending influence on our breakers. I think the Quetzal deck is going to be really strong. I think it's going to be aggressive. And I'm really excited to see new Anarchs emerge that have a lot of power and aggression. And I'd like to see competitive Anarchs that aren't just noise. Okay, moving on, we have another Anarch card. This one is a program. It is one of the first of the new Stealth Breakers. And I talked about the Stealth Breakers a little bit in the last episode. Dagger is the only one we have now. This one is called Black Cat. It is four to install, one MU. It's three strength, three influence as well. Icebreaker Fractor. It has one credit, break a barrier subroutine, or up to three subroutines if you spent a credit from a stealth card. That's pretty cool. Then it gets plus one strength for two credits, or you get plus two strength if you spent a stealth credit. Now, the absolute first thing to talk about with Black Cat is that you can use it outside of stealth credits. It, it doesn't require the stealth credits to, to break ice. That's really awesome. That gives the card a lot of flexibility over, say, Dagger or, you know, any other, any other stealth breaker that comes out in the future that pretty much requires the stealth credits. So that alone is pretty good. The fact that you can, you know, if you have a stealth credit generator in your deck, but you haven't drawn it yet, Black Cat still does something. Now, that said, the stealth power of this card is substantially lower than Dagger, and I would argue the other card in the pack that is a Stealth Breaker we'll get to soon. So having your Stealth uh, credits is going to be less relevant with this card than it is with some of the other Stealth Breakers. This is going to be a nice alternative to Corroder in a handful of decks. It's going to be probably too much influence to consider over Corroder in a non-Anarch faction, but I do think that if you had a really strong stealth breaker setup, that you you know you had a lot of ways to generate stealth credits, like I think especially cloak, then this card might be worth considering outside of Anarch. A good breaker. I I like to see new breakers that challenge kind of our perception of of icebreakers. Okay, the next card in the pack is another Anarch card, and this was spoiled quite a while ago, and I just remember laughing really hard when I first saw the text of this card. It is a resource, two to play. I think it's called Duggars? Dugars? Duggars. I'm going to call it Duggars. It's a CD location, 
Not a surprise if you look at the art. Four influence. Its only ability is four clicks, draw ten cards. Ten! Okay, so like if you're playing a 45 card deck, you're going to start with five of them in your opening hand. So when you use this card for the first time, you're going to draw 25% of your deck. That is just hilariously awesome. The power level of this card is is so high, it's funny. Now, that said, are you going to want to use this card? My general reaction as of now is no, you aren't. I can't really see it being worthwhile to spend an entire turn to shape the perfect hand. You could just play wild side, and I think that's going to do better for you. That said, I think this card might be central to a powerful Anarch we see down the road. If we have the ability to generate more clicks, this card suddenly becomes a lot more sensible. If we have the ability to take one or two clicks after we use this ability, or if hypothetically there was a way to reduce the cost to activate this card, or something like that, then I could see this card being a lot more popular and mainstream. For now, not going to replace Wildside for me in the current Anarchs. I think the Anarch big box is going to make this card make a lot more sense. But man, is this card cool. I feel the same way about this card as I felt about uh, Eliza's toy box. This is just so cool. I don't care if it's going to be good or not. The idea that this is in the game as something we can do is is just fun and awesome. I, I really like to see this card. I like to see high uh, influence Anarch cards. This card's cool. Now we're moving on to some criminal cards. And uh, the first one we have is Hardware. It's a console, a new one. Four cost, unique as they are, boxy, or box E, plus two MU, and your maximum hand size is increased by two. Limit one console, obviously. And the other critical thing with this card is it's one influence. I really, really, really like the design of this card. This is the first console I've seen where I felt that it was very general use. I think there have been a handful of competitive decks, a lot of them have been Kate, where they don't really have a console to play. There, there isn't really something they, they want to include in that slot. And having this card in the pool, I don't know if it's going to go into the Kate deck I'm talking about, but it gives every deck who doesn't have an obvious console, something to think about and an option. This is a very general use card. And the the plus two hand size is really good as a pseudo plascrete type effect. Now, it's only going to make your maximum hand size seven, uh, assuming you don't have any brain damage or anything like that. So you'd have to come up with a way to increase your hand size by one more if you wanted to be able to survive two Scorched Earths. But when you consider that four uh, cost is kind of the going rate for 2MU, having the additional bonus of the increased hand size really makes this card uh, a decent choice. I like this card. I don't immediately know which deck I'm going to put it into, but I think the plus 2MU and the plus 2 hand size for four cost, and it's just a good deal. Okay, the next card we have is also a criminal card. It's a resource, the Supplier, a unique card. Three to install, two influence. It has click, host a resource or piece of hardware from your grip on the Supplier. And then when your turn begins, you may install a hosted card, lowering the install cost by two. So the very first thing I would say about this card is that it doesn't combo with other cards that have when your turn begins effects. I saw a lot of people online initially wanted to pair this with activist support because they thought they could drop activist support in play and then sacrifice it to Aesop's Pawn Shop to avoid having to take the tag from activist support but getting the good bad pub effect out of the way. Unfortunately, that isn't how this card works. 
Remember that the way that you resolve multiple simultaneous effects in Netrunner is you get to select the order, but they all trigger at the same time. In other words, the supplier would trigger and you could put activist support in play, but all of your beginning of turn effects have already been triggered. In other words, activist support comes into play and it doesn't do anything until next turn. So even though this thing isn't particularly exciting as a combo enabler, it is a pretty good economic card all around. I think it could be really strong in a criminal deck that was focused on connections. It's going to make like Compromised Employee and Katie Jones and The Source and a bunch of other cards free to play, which is really good. And I'm always in favor of seeing different and kind of challenging economy cards to build your deck around. Okay, moving on now to the second of the Stealth Breakers in the pack. This is a Shaper one. It is one to install and also one MU, two strength, two influence. It's a decoder, icebreaker, has one credit, break a code gate subroutine, and then it has credit plus three strength, and you can only use the stealth credits to activate that ability. How good is this icebreaker? Holy crap. This is an amazing icebreaker. I'm I'm just hyped about this. It's so good. This is what we need to kind of change the code gate uh, metagame, I'll say. <laughs> uh, you know, I think Yogg has been on its way out for a long time. There's still quite a few people playing it. But this is a challenge to, to say, like, Torch and Gordian Blade and Zool, and those those other icebreakers that we see in Shaper, if you're able to generate a stealth credit. I talked about before how I thought that Cloak was extremely good, and that the recurring credit it gave you was really strong if you had some way to mitigate the MU. This is just going to make Cloak and Dagger and just generally the use of stealth credits a lot more viable. This is a really, really, really solid code gate breaker. So let's just go through a couple of the interactions with common ice. First of all, without stealth credits, this is going to get you through like Quandary, Enigma, all of those really low strength code gates. So, so first of all, you have that going. Second, five strength is a really common strength on the high-end code gates. It's a very, very common strength. Toll booth is just the immediately most obvious one. So this is going to break toll booth for five. That's a little lackluster, but it's among the best in terms of ways to break uh, toll booth. I mean, outside of Fem Fatale, toll booth is pretty much going to cost you four. So something that breaks it for five not too bad. The two influence is going to make this viable in any deck that can generate the stealth credits. But given that you already have two ways to generate stealth credits in faction plus Ghost Runner, I think we're going to see this actually in Shaper a fair amount. This is a really good icebreaker. It It's just solid outside of stealth, and with stealth it becomes pretty good. So, yeah, I, I really like this. I'm definitely going to be trying to play this. I think it's certainly going to be replacing uh, Gordian Blade in my Shaper decks as I move towards Stealth and experimenting with Stealth. The next card we have is also Shaper. It's a resource location. Order of Soul. It is unique. And two to install, one influence. The first time you have no credits in your credit pool each turn, gain a credit. This card seems really, really good to me, but I have yet to figure out which kind of path I want to take to make this card good. It seems to me like there is an entire tier of runner decks that are all focused on having low numbers of credits. And they're generally the ones that don't play Siphon. 
like the the big one I'm thinking is noise. Your average noise deck is really just going to generate maybe five to six credits in a turn and then try to spend most of those credits. And they're going to be getting them from like Aesop's Pawn Shop and thing and recurring credit generators and things like that. So this is maybe something you could abuse in that kind of deck. I'm also kind of thinking Nasir, it would be pretty good, given that he can manipulate his credit pool pretty easily and tends to be pretty smart about the way, you know, the credits in his pool and has a lot of manipulation for that. Another big thing I'd point out with this card is that it triggers on each turn, which would include your opponent's turn. So if you could somehow have a way to empty your credit pool every turn, including your opponents, you'd be able to get two credits out of this every sequence of turns. I, I think there's merit to this card. I just don't know where I'm going to take this card, where, where other players are going to take this card, but I would not at all be surprised to see it in competitive decks. The next card we have is also a resource, and it is also unique. It is Hades Shard. It's neutral, seven cost, just like the other shard, and it is one influence. Virtual source. Whenever you make a successful run on archives, instead of accessing cards, you may install Hades Shard from your grip, ignoring all costs. And then it has trash, access all cards in archives. Limit one per deck. These shards are pretty neat. This is the second one we've seen. I like the concept of them and I've talked about before how I really like limit one per deck although I think I like that more on the corporation side than I do the runner side I think the runner tends to be more about uh, playing redundant copies of cards in their deck this is probably going to be something I'm going to be playing in noise I am going to at least be horsing around with this card in noise I think the big idea is that you're going to try to get this in your hand and get it installed fairly early in the game, and then have it just sit and play until you can use it in a timely manner. I think it really works well with mass install, and some of the other ways to trigger Noise's ability multiple times in a turn. I can imagine having this card in play, and then using mass install, or, or just installing a bunch of programs to get additional cards into an already full archives and then popping this thing. I think it might have some merit in that context. I'm really not sure if I'm going to want to play this card outside of that deck. There might be a few other decks that would consider this thing, but uh, I think also a deck that maybe plays really heavy on the data leak reversal plan would consider this card. But I think one of the big drawbacks is that being tagged is going to make this thing a huge target. And costing seven is kind of insane. You're going to have to put it in a deck where accessing all the cards in archives has a potential to win you the game. And right now I feel like noise is the easiest and most competitive way to do that. I'm going to be trying it in noise, but I'm not totally convinced that it's going to make the cut. Are we going to be playing this over maybe a Gorman drip? Probably, but are we going to want to cut this to get another clone chip or to just use the influence somewhere else? Probably. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm willing to try this card in noise. That seems to be the most obvious place to use it. And uh, I like to see having more interesting tools. Okay, and now we come to the last card in this very excellent pack. Another unique one. Another resource. This is Rachel Beckman. She's eight to install. Wow. One influence. Resource connection. That's nice. You have an additional click to spend each turn. Trash her if you are tagged. This card is awesome. For the reason that I said the Toy Box and Duggars were awesome. The power level of this card is really high, and that is just nice to see. I like to see runner cards that have extremely high power levels for high costs. Not only is that fun, because we all like to do really powerful stuff in games, but I think it's also an area of the runner side of the game that's unexplored. 
most of the runner effects are pretty low power level. This is a really powerful effect that is going to be pretty easy to deal with as the corp, but is going to give the runner a lot of utility as soon as they're able to do this. Now, how are we going to afford an 8-cost resource? I think that's the big thing to be answered with this card. But in a deck that could reasonably support this, the one additional click is really strong. This would be the type of card that we're going to try to pair with cards that use our clicks. I don't know if Duggars is the card we're going to want to use this with, but that's an example of what I'm talking about. That we're going to want to pair this with click abilities because then we're going to cheat the utility of those click abilities. Trasher, if you're tagged, that's pretty damning that they don't even have to spend, the corp doesn't even have to spend a click and two credits to deal with her. She just dies if you're tagged. The other problem with that is if you float a tag at some point during your turn, she dies. So, you know, you can't siphon while this car is in play, even if you were intending on ditching the tags afterwards. You'd have to have, like, New Angeles City Hall or something like that to prevent yourself from getting tagged. This card's going to require some work to, to make its thing happen, but the thing it does is really powerful, really cool, flavorful. I like the flavor text. I, I, I like this card all around. That said probably isn't going in any of my tournament decks. That's going to do it for First Contact. This is a really cool pack. I am very enthusiastic about this pack. I was pretty lukewarm on the spaces between. I thought the currents were cool. This pack really redeems uh, any sort of ill feelings I had towards the last data pack. There's a lot of interesting tools going on on both sides of the game here. I think the runner side of the pack is maybe a little better. I think the Stealth Breakers being an actual competitive thing with Black Cat and Refractor is really cool. I'm definitely in favor of seeing different Icebreaker setups than we've seen so far in the game. I think we're, we're all kind of getting tired of Fixed Strength Breakers with Data Sucker, and even though those have sort of been on the wane, giving the Stealth Breaker set up this infusion of cards, two really good breakers, is going to make the that breaker set up competitive, in my opinion. I really like Boxy. Uh, giving us more general use consoles is very cool. I just like the idea of having more options for consoles. And like I said, I, I feel like four and an influence is going to be a pretty good deal on that, even outside of criminal. I think the supplier it might create an entire new type of deck that's that's pretty competitive, focused around the connection cards. There's a lot of ammunition in this pack for runner. I will be among the legions of players trying Ketzel and seeing what works with her and what does not. Since she's so new, I think there hasn't been a proven way to play her yet, and I hope there will be a proven way to play her. I hope we see a variety of competitive Anarchs come Worlds. Looking at the Corp side of things, Chrissium Grid is pretty much what I wanted Sealed Vault to be. Uh, we got a couple conditional pieces of ice that I'm not really that excited about. A couple kind of bad NBN cards. The corpse side of the pack has some interesting tools, but I'm not immediately wowed. There are a couple exceptions. I mentioned that I really, really love Eliza's toolbox, or sorry, toy box. Um, I'm pretty excited about IQ, although I think it kind of just does something we can already do in a neat kind of exaggerated way. Um, I don't really think that Shattered Remains or Lancelot are going to see play for quite a while. Lancelot maybe more than Shattered Remains. I already went on a huge tirade about Kronos Project and how I think it's an incredible design and I'm pumped to play it in Personal Evolution. The biggest thing for me, kind of in the arc of where the game is headed, is the two Wayland cards in the pack, actually. Um, I think both of these are kind of signs of what's to come for Wayland. 
and hopefully we're going to see a Glacier style or, or a slow, big agenda, powerful Wayland deck that I think we all were initially tempted to build out of the core set, but has never really been competitive. Well, that's going to do it for me today. Uh, thank you for watching, and please click that subscribe and the thumbs up button. If you want to buy or read more about the packs, I put some links in the description below to the publisher's site, so you can check those out. Thanks again, and I will see you for my next video.